You're listening to the Northfield Podcast with Caleb Gordon with news and perspectives on culture from a biblical worldview. To find out more on Caleb, go to www.calebgordon.com. Once again, that's www.calebgordon.com. Welcome to the Northfield Podcast, everybody. Glad you could join me tonight. I'm going to continue in the wheelhouse of the questions that you guys have asked on social media. And so tonight what I want to tackle and what I want to cover and talk about is the return of the Lord. So that was a question that was asked. So we're going to jump on that and we're going to discuss uh, that topic tonight. And so I want to... um, I want, to, I want to touch on that because I think it is something that is necessary to talk about. I and mean, I think a lot of people have some misconceptions and some, and some really poor ideas. And so what I want to do is address things from a biblical perspective. Um, and, and so we'll go after that tonight. So, But I want to start with this idea that I mean, everybody lives in our culture right now, and especially in America, a large percentage of folks in America, we live in what's called the normalcy bias. Things will always go as things have always gone. Nothing's, there's nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, we're, we can, we're Americans, man. We can handle it. We can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And so we've got all these things handled. We've got everything figured out. And each of us, man, we're all pulled in different directions in our lives. Every single one of us, we're all going a hundred different directions, especially in, um, if you're a parent and you've got children that are playing sports and you're doing something, so you're, I mean, you're running and you're going and we have, we have three teenagers now and man, we are constantly on the go with different things. One of my kids has a job and so they're not quite to that age where they're driving but they still are working so we're taking them to work and so when we're when we got all kinds of stuff going on in our world but I, I, in saying that how many of us really have that thought process of man Jesus is going to return soon I think we have those kind of mindsets when we maybe listen to a podcast like this or we're sitting in a church building and a message is brought up hey man Jesus is coming back so we're like uh oh that we that goes off in our minds and we're like Hmm, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's a potential there. Um, but my question is, um, because it's normal to have those conversations and those thoughts in those, in those arenas, but at 145 in the afternoon on a Tuesday, are we thinking about the return of the Lord? I think probably for most of us, we're not. Um, most of us have deadlines and meetings and, um, children and wives and husbands and just just the normal everyday stresses of everything in our lives. And so we don't, I mean, a lot of us just don't think about that stuff. But I mean, in the Bible, it says, I mean, Matthew chapter 24, verse uh, 36, it says, but concerning that day, that hour, no, that day and that hour, not, let me try that again. Holy cow. You'd think I could read better than this, wouldn't you? But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as the as the as it were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. So I want to stop there for just a minute because I, I look at this, and I'm going to just say this. Satan doesn't care how he gets us as long as he gets us. And for so many of us, man, we're living directly in the days of Noah. Man, we are consumed with so many different things. It, and it's Satan, like I said, if he doesn't care how he gets you, as long as he gets you. And he he's really good at distracting people. Like, super, super good at distracting people. And I'll go ahead and he's distracting a lot of people that are genuinely, I think, lost. But they're they're distracted with religiosity and they think, they think they're, pers- they're, they're, they're pursuing Christ and they think that they're saved. But in reality, 
in reality, they're probably lost because there's real no hunger for the things of God. They're not chasing after it. I mean, church is just sort of kind of an afterthought. Um, you know, if I don't have anything else going on, I'll, yeah, I'll go to church if I got nothing else going on. And so we have that mentality. And so you look at all this, and if he can distract us from the truth for just long enough, and he can distract us with good things, and that, that's the thing that I it's driving me insane is that Satan does distract us with good things. Most people are distracted by good things, not wicked, evil, horrible things. But I'm going to tell you this, listen up. If Satan can distract you with a good thing and replace the best thing, that good thing can become a stumbling block and cause you to miss heaven because you've been distracted. Follow me there. Follow me. Satan wants to distract us. And there's a lot of things that are really good and legitimately good things. Marriage, food, hobbies. I mean, that's what the, that's what the Bible says right here. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving it into marriage. None of those things are bad. Not one single thing that I just read off is bad. Is marriage good? Absolutely. God ordained and set up marriage. So there, that's great. Love it. Is there anything wrong with eating or drinking? Absolutely not, man. We love these things. Man, good fajitas. Man, a good, man, a good drink. Holy cow. Those are not bad things. But if Satan can use those things, and Satan's really good at twisting the gifts of God and perverting them and turning them in on themselves... And that's what he does. He's a master at flipping and swapping and deceiving us. And we, we look around and we see all the things of this world that are um, good, but Satan twists and perverts it. And, and I'm telling you, Satan doesn't care how he gets you as long as he gets you. And he'll get you with good things. And it, it's one of those things that really catches us unaware. I mean, in fact, in fact, that's what the Bible says. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 24, um, verse 39, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And guys, we need to really, really, really hone in and think about this. We have folks who are attempting to tell people that Jesus is coming back. And when we start to have that conversation, it never fails. This conversation never fails. I'll have that. I'll start talking about, hey man, I believe that Jesus is coming back, and we'll maybe get into it. But they'll they'll throw out, hey, hey Caleb, hey, nobody knows the day or the hour, so let's just not even, let's just not even talk about it. And I'm like, wait a second. I mean, the Bible has a large percentage of it talking about the return of the Lord, so I think that there there should be some conversation about Jesus coming back because there was a bulk of scripture that talks about Jesus coming back. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says that Jesus is going to appear to those that are eagerly awaiting his return. I mean, think about that. Those that are, what if you're, not, ask yourself this question. What if you're not eagerly awaiting his return? What if, you, what if you're just so distracted and so caught up with the world that you don't even really care about Jesus' return because you have such a love and such an affinity for the things of this world that you're, you're not even focused on that? We have folks who are attempting to tell people about Jesus, and we've got all these people that are, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't, uh, you can't talk about that. You can't. Nobody knows the day or the hour, so let's just not even talk about it. No, we should talk about it. And, and so what happens is when you start to talk about this, you get lumped in with the crazy people like Harold Camping. He's now dead, but Harold Camping made all these different predictions when Jesus, like he would set dates. Like, I don't remember like the exact dates or like October 12th or something. I, I do, I can't even remember the exact dates of when Harold, but he, he had did this like three or four times that I know of. And we tried to stamp a date out there and said, Jesus is returning on this date. Jesus is turning on, is returning on that date, this date. Boom, 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 boom. And he like, he threw up perverted, you know, Bible verses that try to like, he took scripture and twisted it and perverted it um, to try to. Um, fit his theology and it's just it was awful and I just was like the scripture tells us that nobody knows we know the times and the seasons and so what happens is that we get coerced into and um, 
lumped into this thing when we say any anytime we have the conversation and say, hey, yeah, I believe Jesus is coming back, we get thrown in this camp of, oh, yeah, oh, look at you, crazy Christian that believes Jesus is coming back. I'm telling you that Jesus is coming back and I'm not setting a date. It may be tomorrow, but it may be a thousand years from now. It, it could be. I, I don't know, but I do know that Jesus is returning and he's returning in in terms of eternity. He's returning soon. And so you've got that that group of people on one spectrum, and then you've got another group of people on the other spectrum that they're they're growing animosity for the things of God. They want to try to help dismiss the idea that there's a God altogether. So they've got evolutionists that are involved saying, hey, we just came from primordial soup and just rained on the rocks for millions of years, and boom, here we were, we're human beings, or here we are, Bob, here we are, blah, 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 blah. And it's really irritating. It's super irritating because you've got that group of people that say these things. In fact, I mean, okay, let me just take you over here into Second Peter, um, and I want you to hear this uh, out of God's word and not my mouth, but God's word. Second Peter chapter three, and we'll start in verse three, three three. Knowing this first. Knowing this first, um, that there will be scoffers who will come in the last days with scoffings, following after their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning. Uh, sound familiar? <laughs> now listen, keep, keep going. For they will deliberately overlook the fact that the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of the water and through the water and by the word of God and that that and by that means of these the world that was that had then existed was flooded with water and perished so you've got an active group of people here who deliberately overlook the fact that God created the world and that God flooded the world and you've got people who are making fun of anybody who they just scoff about the things of God. They're like, oh, where's the promise of his coming? Yeah, my grandmother, my great-grandmother talked about the return of the Lord. My grandma, they've been saying that for years, man. There's no way that, that God's coming back. Because guess what? They've been saying that for years. Everything's going to go as all things have always gone, Caleb. Quit, quit trying to be that crazy Christian and rock the boat. You're an idiot. You're just an idiot, Caleb. That's what you are. And so they scoff and they make fun of, oh, ever since the father, ever since my grandmother, my grandma's dead now, blah, 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 blah. They continue in this fashion. They can they continue in this over and over and over. So you've got this growing animosity of people that say, man, God didn't create the world. God didn't flood the world. Billions and billions of years ago, we came from primordial soup and that's just where it came from and blah, blah, blah. And so you've got Christians that quietly just like, oh man, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. And I think this is the reason we're not sharing is because we've got those two giant spectrums. You don't want to get labeled as the crazy Christian, and you also don't want to be labeled as a non-science believer. And so I think we, for this reason, we're not sharing and we're not talking about the return of the Lord because of these two things, I, primarily. And it all boils down to shame. Shame. There are folks who are scoffing and making fun of the idea that Jesus is returning. And so what we do as Christians is we just be, we just keep quiet. We're just quiet about it, and we don't even want to talk about it. So we're like, mm, not mm -mm. don't want to, don't want to say anything, don't want to rock the boat. I just want to keep my mouth shut and keep my friends, keep whatever I need to do because you know, Caleb. I mean, really, does it really matter? Well, yeah, it does matter. It, it does matter. Second Peter chapter three and verse twelve says this: waiting for the hastening and the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will set a fire and dissolve the heavenly bodies and will melt and burn but according to his promise we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth which righteousness where where righteousness will dwell and another text is so we, I mean there's coming a day we should have this eagerness man this world shouldn't be something that we want we should have a longing and a desire for what's coming next. Jesus has got stuff that's way better. Jesus has got stuff that is just incredibly top shelf. 
And I, I love this this verse. It says, Christ having been offered, this is uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So I've got to ask you guys a question. Are you eagerly waiting for him? I mean, that's the genuine question here. Are we eagerly waiting? Or are we just distracted? How should we act as a result of looking forward to his coming? How should Christians act if we believe, if we genuinely believe that Jesus is returning? I mean, if that's something that is on the radar, I'm like, yeah, man, I, mm -hmm, absolutely. I believe Jesus is coming and he could come any day. How should we act? Well, I'm glad you asked because in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, it talks about this. Um, flip over here and just to get to it. Therefore, so this is a declarative statement. How should we act as Christians? Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But you do know this, that the master of the house has known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. Guys, think about this. Think about this. If we know, if we believe, if we as Christians say, man, I believe Jesus is coming. Because a lot of us, I think, do. We just don't want to talk about it. If we believe that Jesus is coming back, we have got to stay awake. We've got to stay awake. We should be doing what God's called us to do. It's time to do battle. If we believe that Jesus is coming a second time, we, sh we darn sure better be telling people about the first time he came. Like, that's where I want to go with this. I don't want to dwell on you know, all the different things of that nature. I want, I want you guys to hear, if you believe it, I don't know what day is coming. I just know that the signs around us point towards him coming. So, I, I, like I said, it could be tomorrow and it could be a thousand years. But regardless, I still die, so I'm going to see Jesus at some point. And I don't want to stand before God and be like, yeah, well, I didn't do much of anything for you. <laughs> I didn't, didn't stand up, didn't talk, didn't, I was pretty quiet about stuff. I don't want to be that guy. It's time for us as Christians to do battle. Stop playing games with our spiritual lives. In war scenarios, soldiers are on alert. And the scripture tells us, therefore, it's a declarative statement. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day the Lord's coming. God's coming, so stay awake. Think about this. If you're laying in bed and you hear a strange noise, think about this. How many, how many of you guys have ever had this happen to you? Like you're laying in bed and you hear like a, it sounds like a footprint or footstep or something, you know, something snaps in the middle of the night and you're like, like you're instantly awake. Adrenaline hits your system and you're like, boom, wide awake. You're alert. You're listening for something else to happen. You're preparing your mind. Okay, if I need to jump, I can defend my wife, I can defend my kids. And you, so you have those scenarios that go through your head because you're alert and you're awake. Why? Because you realize that there's potential for danger. Why is it that most people in the church don't understand that the issues that are at hand and that the issue is that we are at war. We are entrenched in battle with the enemy and Satan knows it. Like Satan knows that you and I are at battle. He knows it and he is actively and just eagerly working to just trip you up, dig holes, lob bombs, destroy us. And here we are just we're looking, we're staring at the mobile in the crib while the house burns to the ground. The signs are all over the place that Jesus is coming back. And most of us are just laying around, not doing much of anything. God tells us to stay awake. Noah, for 120 years, think about this ministry. Noah, for 120 years, pleaded with people to come to the ark of safety. Please come to the ark. Built the ark. Man, they made fun of him. They mocked him. You crazy old man. You are out of your ever loving mind. I cannot believe you're, what are you. Why are you wasting your time on this? What are you doing? Like, you're out of your mind, old man. <laughs> but then when it all hit the fan. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Maybe he's not as crazy as he. Maybe he's not as crazy as we thought. Maybe he's, maybe he was right. Oh, gosh. This is. This is actually potentially bad. Uh-oh. And so they start freaking out. And, but it's too late. The rain came, swept them away. Only then did people see. 
And my fear is that I don't even know. I mean, the scripture says that when the church is taken out, Satan's going to deceive many. So there's going to be a lot of people that are not. I mean, I think there's going to be a few of us. There are a few people that are going that have had the gospel preached to them. They're going to like light bulb moment and be like, "Holy cow!" I heard my preacher talk about this. I heard this podcast. I heard different. I mean, all the different things. All of the different. I heard this. And when that day comes, it's gonna it's gonna cost some people's cost people their lives. Now is when we need to engage people. Now is when we need to talk about it. If we believe Jesus is coming a second time, we have got to talk about him the first time. You've got a circle of influence. Engage people where they are. Start telling them about Jesus, what Jesus means to you, what Jesus did in your life. Share your testimony. Start there. Share your testimony and be like, here's, here's where I was, dead in my sins, and, I, and the gospel was preached. I was God breathed life back into me and I repented of my sins and Jesus is now the Savior and Lord of my life. I'm telling you, it is so epically important that we actively share our faith because I'm telling you, Jesus is coming again. And it's sooner than you and I can even begin to understand or comprehend. I want you to think about this last thing. So many of us, we go on vacations um, and we, leading up to our vacation, we tell everybody about what we're, where we're going, what we're doing, what we're going to be a part of. And, and we'll, we'll daydream about that stuff. We'll Google where we're going to go. We'll look at pictures. We're, well, I mean, we'll check out everything about it, getting prepared. And guys, this is the ultimate. And, and maybe this is a stretch, but man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and use it. This is the ultimate vacation. Where sin will be wiped out. There will be no more tears. There will be no, so- no more sorrow. This is the ultimate in refreshment. Ultimate in fulfilled joy. And we're not even talking about it. We're scared to death to talk about it. Oh, I don't want to be the guy that rocks the boat. It's time to rock some boats, guys. Rock some boats to talk to, about- talk to people about this. Don't be afraid. Jesus says he'll be with you. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. For I, the Lord your God, I am with you. You're walking into this battle, guys. There is an application there for you in that. Don't be dismayed. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Christ is with you. And I think it's high time that folks begin to talk about this and think on it and pray on it and encourage one another all the more as we begin to see that day approaching. Don't forsake the assembling together. Now is when the church needs to gather. Now is when Christians need to be active with their faith. Now is when we need to be doing what Christ has called us to do. It's high time we stand for the gospel. All right. I love you guys. Go get them.